Alright, it's going to be your third and final lesson in the unit. All right, you're going to be learning about particles of the standard model. The picture to the right uh, depicts particles of the standard model. If you're confused, you should be because you've never learned it before. Or rather, you've never seen it before either. <clears throat> now, uh, and I want to talk about, I want to mention something about the last lesson. Half of you guys, oh, okay. In the lesson, I gave you two streamable links to watch. Right? The first one was about atoms, and the second one was about uh, the spectrum, absorption uh, spectrum. Now, most of you watched the first video, which is great. Uh, but then half of you guys that didn't even go on to watch the second uh, streamable video, which means that you were going to be more confused than you originally were going to be if you just went on to the lesson, right? Because the second streamable link was a necessary precursor to the rest of the, video, uh, rest of the lesson. And if you skip that one, you're going to be more confused than you would normally be. So before we go into deeper into particles of the standard model, we want to understand what's inside an atom first. Now I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with what's inside an atom. So inside an atom, you're, you're, you're told that there's a neutron, there's a proton, and there's an electron. When the proton and the electron, they all go inside the nucleus, the nucleus being the middle of this atom. Well, based on your previous knowledge, well, like charges should repel, right? Like charges should repel because they're all positive, right? All these protons want to get as far away from each other as possible. And all these electrons want to get as far away from each other as possible as well. And electrons do succeed, whereas the protons do not succeed. And why is that? What keeps them all together? There is something called the strong force, the strong nuclear force keeps all these protons and protons and all these neutrons together. Right? And the strong force exhibits a gluon field, much like how the force of gra gravity exhibits a gravitational field. So the gluon field exists between these protons and neutrons and that that makes them stick together. Right? That makes them stick together. And you need protons and neutrons you need a neutron for a proton to stick uh, to each other, All right? So you need that. You need that. Now let's talk more about protons and neutrons and the strong force. Well, how does that work, right? Well, that if the strong force were actually a thing, well, how do they keep uh, the protons and neutrons together, right? How how do we how does that happen? Well. First thing you must know that protons, I want you to focus on this picture right here, protons and neutrons uh, consist of quarks. Right? You can break down protons and neutrons into uh, further objects. Now, protons are made up of two up quarks, right? Two up quarks. This is just a name we give them. It has really no meaning. Two up quarks and one down quark. And a neutron is composed of one up quark and two down quarks. Uh, the charges are irrelevant for now, but I might as well explain them. So two up quarks have a charge of two thirds each. And one down quark has a charge of negative one third. And when you add up all these charges, you get plus one. Which so happens to be a proton, right? A proton is positively charged. And a neutron, since it only has one up quark and two down quarks, well, if you add all these up, you're going to get zero. Amazing. And so if you take a look on the top right-hand picture, you'll see uh, springs. They're just drawn on there. They're not actually springs in between the quarks. But you can kind of get how they stick to each other now. So this is a proton right here since it has two up quarks. And this is a neutron since it has two down quarks. 
So they're sticking together because of this interaction, this glue, this gluon field. And well, how does the gluon field work? Well, the bond right hand GIF explains how that works. Uh, one of these particles uh, spontaneously turns into something else, transfers to the other uh, particle, or rather the other neutron, proton, and that makes them stick together. So this constant interaction, this constant interaction allows these protons and neutrons to stick together. You don't really need to know what the what, what's happening right here, right now. Just know that this is how this is how the strong force works. Something happens, transfers over to the neutron, something happens in the neutrons, transfers over to the proton, and that's how they stick together. This constant movement allows protons and neutrons to stick together. And this happens many times in one second. Many, 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 many times in one second. Right. So that's all you need now. Now before we move on, let's talk about the four fundamental forces of the universe. And there may be a fifth fundamental force of the universe. There may be. We haven't discovered it yet. So the first force is the strong force. The strong force is the strongest, probably depicted by the name, right? as the strength of one. And we, we're going to measure all the other forces in relation to one. And so the strong force only acts when you're in the range of 10 to the negative 15 meters, which basically means they only really act in the nucleus on the the really microscopic scale of the nucleus. They only act in that range. Right? And so usually only protons and nucleus uh, are in that range. And, if you, and since there's a limit to the range of the strong force, there's a reason why nucleus cannot hold an infinite amount of protons and neutrons. And there's a reason. Uh, and the particles, you can, we can ignore the particles for now because it doesn't matter. So there's a strong force, there's the electromagnetic force. Right, the electromagnetic force is infinite. It's just that as you get farther and farther far away from something, electromagnetic uh, force decreases. Then there's the weak force. The weak force has something to do with uh, the K of particles. Right, and the, the range of that is even smaller, 10 to negative 18 meters. So it only acts in that range. And then there's gravitational force. Gravitational force is the weakest of all forces. Again, it's infinite because as you get far away from something, it decreases by a lot. And the fifth fundamental force, uh, scientists propose, physicists propose that as something to do with dark matter, uh, something to do with it. And that's the fifth fundamental force that we haven't discovered yet. Now, let's move on. Now we're actually going to get into uh, the actual particles. Now, on your reference table, on the third page of your reference table, you should see this uh, image at the bottom right-hand corner. And so the, it, it says the classification of matter. So matter can be broken down into hadrons and something we call leptons. So we're going to define leptons in this slide. Well, leptons are particles that don't interact via the strong nuclear force. They interact via the weak force. So that, that must mean that leptons are even smaller than, uh, than protons and neutrons. Now, you can ignore leptons interact with bosons, you can just ignore that, it doesn't matter. So leptons, as you can see in this image, the green ones are the leptons. Electrons are leptons. Something called muons are electrons, something called tau, tau neutrino, muon neutrino, electron neutrino, they're all electrons. These are all, I mean not all electrons, these are all leptons, right? That's the only thing you need to know. All these green things right here, they're all leptons. That's actually the extent of what you need to know. Now, now since we're done with leptons, we're going to move on to hadrons, hadrons now. And hadrons are nuclear particles like protons and neutrons that act, interact via the strong nuclear force. 
So you can see up here, quarks, and you can see that hadrons are separated into baryons and into mesons. Right? So baryons are protons and neutrons. And they're made up of three quarks. All right, so baryons are anything that can be transformed into a proton or a neutron. And here you see this image on the top right hand corner on the slide. This image is also in your reference table on page three. So baryons are made up of two up quarks, or rather made up of three quarks, right? You see here, baryons are made up of three quarks. And so baryons are protons or neutrons. Protons, as you can see on the bottom image, a proton is composed of two up quarks and one down quark. And if you look at the up quark right here, on the top right hand corner, you'll see quarks. And you'll see that an up quark has a charge of plus two thirds E. This E is elementary charge, right? And you can figure out what elementary charge is on the first page of your reference table. And a down quark, if you move down here, a down quark has a charge of negative one third elementary charges. Well, what's with the charm and top quark, right? Well, what's this all about? Let me move on to the next slide and see if it's there. It is there. It is there. Perfect. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that explanation for the next slide. But let's talk more about protons and neutrons. Again, protons must always have a charge of plus one. Neutrons must always have a charge of plus zero. Keep that in mind. For this slide. Now, again, focus on this image, this uh, black image right here and focus on the quarks. So this is generation one, two, and three. Up quark, C and T, well we know C is charm quark, and T is top quark, D is down, S is strange, B is bottom. Okay, and so they all, you'll notice that the top row all have the same charge, and the bottom row also all have the same charge as well. But as you increase but as you go from generation 1 to generation 3, what happens is that the quarks gain more mass. They also have the same charge, but as you increase in generation, their mass increases. And if your mass increases, well, due to the formula E is equal to mc squared, right? That's we haven't really learned talked about it, but all of you should be familiar with it, E is equal to mc. So basically, if you have more mass, the more energy you have. But because they have more mass and because they have more energy, they are much more unstable. So these charm and top quarks, these strange and bottom quarks, they only they exist for half, for less than a second, sometimes even less than a microsecond or even less than a nanosecond. So these particles only exist for a brief amount of time. Up and down quarks, on the other hand, are much more stable. They exist for a very long time. So eventually, the top and charm quarks, bottom and strange quarks, they decay. Uh, they decay. They eventually decay. But they 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 still are uh, possible. Entities. I'm not sure if that's the right word. Uh, whatever. All right. So let's get to some problem solving. Let me just bring everything up. Oh, this is awkward. Okay. Perfect. Number four. Quarks that compose a baryon may have charges of what? Now, a baryon. We know what a baryon is. It's either a proton or a neutron. All right, so a proton and neutron. So a proton must have a charge of plus one, and a neutron has a, must have a charge of zero. I don't even know why I put the plus there, but it doesn't matter. So it must have a charge of zero. And the question wants you may have charges of what? 
Well, let's look at A. May have charges, well, plus two thirds, plus two thirds, and negative one third gives you plus one. So that's definitely possible, right? That's definitely possible. So you're looking for an answer choice that either has a charge of plus one or a charge of uh, zero. And now B plus one third E minus one third E and plus two thirds E gives you a charge of plus two thirds. All right. C, you get a total charge of negative two E and D, you get a total charge of plus four thirds E. So you want a charge of either plus one E or zero. And so A is your only possible answer, right? Because they want a baryon. They want possible charges for a baryon. And when you add all of them up, when you have all when you add all of them up, you get plus one. Now number five, so the question says which which combination of quarks uh, produces a neutral baryon? And since the only type of baryons you're gonna be learning about are protons and neutrons. Well, the charge of a neutral baryon is zero because it's neutral. It's zero. So you want quarks that add up to zero. Let's take a look at A, choice A, CTS. Now you're going to refer to the your third page of your reference table, which is this uh, page right here, this chart right here. So CTS, well, C is a charm quark indicated by this letter C over here, charm. So A, a charm quark, we have a charge of plus two thirds. T is a top quark, is another charge of plus two thirds. And a strange quark has a charge of negative one third. And if you add all this up, you get plus one. Plus one, E. So that's definitely not it, right? So you're going to do the same exact thing. Well, let me do one more choice, DSB. DSB. Uh, D, according to your chart, D is negative one-third. S is also negative one-third. And B is also negative one-third. And then you get negative one E, which is definitely not possible. Right? It's not even a particle at that point. It's not an electron. Electrons are not made up of uh, quarks. So you're going to do the same exact thing for C and D, and you're going to figure out, well, which one gives you a charge of zero? Right? Do the same exact thing for C and D, and then you can answer the question. Six was the total number of quarks in a helium nucleus consisting of two protons and two neutrons. Uh, two protons. Well, if you think about it, one proton has three quarks, one neutron has three quarks. Do the math, right? It's it's actually that simple. So that's six. Seven is the same thing. It says a deuterium nucleus consists of one proton and one neutron. So what is the quark composition? So again, remember, in one proton, how many up quarks are there, right? How many up quarks? So up and down, and same thing with neutron. I think you can look back in the video to see, but it's in one of the slides. I'll also post the PowerPoint. But it's definitely in one of the slides, how many up and down quarks there are. So if you figure that out, you'll answer the question. Eight. Uh, a particle unaffected by an electric field could have a, a quark composition of what? When it says unaffected by the electric field, it means it doesn't have a charge, which means they're looking for a neutron, right? This particle that's unaffected by an electric field would be a neutron. It doesn't have a charge. Could have a quark composition of what? So you're looking for a quark composition that gives you a total charge of zero. So you're gonna do the same thing here. You're gonna add up. You're gonna add up all of these choices. 
you're going to add up all of these numbers and you're going to get an answer. So plus, let's do A. Let me see if it's not the, actually, let's start with D. So U, U, D. U is an up quark, has a charge of plus two thirds. U is also still an up quark and D is a down quark and you get plus one E. So D is definitely not the answer choice. You're gonna add up all these answer choices or rather add up all these symbols and then you're gonna figure out an answer. And it's the same process. So figure out which one gives you zero when you add them all up. Same thing with nine. Oh, nine might not be, huh? I mean, I'm gonna skip it. It's a bad placement. All right, let's do 10. A top quark has an approximate charge of what? Now, a top quark has a charge, according to your reference table, of plus two thirds E. Well, if you know that one E has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to a negative 19 coulombs, which is on your reference table, then what's plus two thirds of E? What's that? What's that gonna be? And that's your answer. What's plus, what's two thirds of 1.6? Right, and that, that should give you your answer. Now we're gonna move on. Uh, we're not done with all the questions yet. We are, we are done with around two thirds of the lesson. Uh, so what's next is we need to learn about antimatter. All right, so antimatter is very important. And so this video, hopefully I didn't watch it, it's been a long time, I hopefully this video gives you a good intro of antimatter. The whole world, nay, the whole universe is made of matter. Everything, you, me, pizza, black holes, puppies, dark matter, everything. But there's also this little thing out there called antimatter. Around the turn of the last century, Einstein was working on the theory of relativity, and other physicists were trying to figure out how the tiniest parts of our universe worked, called quantum theory. This was all done with math, lots and lots of math. At one point, a physicist named Paul Dirac realized x squared equals four has two answers. Two amazing, right? and negative two. This means if, say, matter is the two, there must be some kind of opposite to fit into the negative two. Physicists called this opposite antimatter. The reason you don't see antimatter around is because if it were to pop into existence and say hit regular matter, the twos would cancel each other out and disappear in a spectacular burst of energy called an annihilation. You probably know that all matter is made of protons and electrons. Well, antimatter, the opposite, is called an antiproton and a positron. A proton is a positive heavy particle. An antiproton is a negative heavy particle. Electrons are light and negative, positrons are light and positive. Again, because of their oppositeness, if they do touch, boom, gone. But we'll come back to that. Even though they have these opposite charges, in theory, antimatter should be exactly the same as matter. After the Big Bang, the universe should have created equal amounts of matter and antimatter, according to physicists. But there's not really any antimatter around because in the first second after the Big Bang, all the matter and antimatter in the newborn universe found each other and bleh, annihilations galore. All the antimatter disappeared in bursts of energy, leaving behind just matter. No one knows exactly why the Big Bang made more matter than antimatter, but these scientists are making antimatter in their lab to find out more about it. This facility creates antimatter uh, using the particle beams at CERN. We convert protons into antiprotons. CERN is the Center for European Nuclear Research. We went there last year and it's where the Large Hadron Collider lives. This antimatter factory takes protons shooting along the LHC and converts those to antihydrogen, the antimatter version of hydrogen. Then Dr. Birch and his team trap the antihydrogen to study it. We know a lot about hydrogen, so we wanted to see how antihydrogen might be different. But remember, you can't let antimatter touch matter, ever. No air, no fancy containers, nothing that is made of matter. 
So the scientists use magnetic fields to hold the antihydrogen inside this trap. They use energy. They behave like little tiny refrigerator magnets, and consequently we basically have to arrange uh, a magnetic field geometry that looks kind of like a bathtub. So the antihydrogen atoms basically sit in a magnetic bathtub or magnetic bottle, but it's really actually physically shaped like a bathtub. It's about the size of sort of a two liter Coke bottle. Oh. The magnetic bathtub is called a Penning-Malmberg trap. The magnetic field keeps the antihydrogen from hitting the walls of the trap and annihilating, because remember, no touch matter. Powerful magnets and lasers force the antihydrogen to get stuck inside the magnetic field, sort of like a piece of candy in a bowl. Once they've trapped the antimatter, the scientists at the factory can learn things about this mysterious mirror of our universe. Disappointingly, antimatter isn't some kind of miracle form of matter. It doesn't have anti-gravity properties. It doesn't do, well, anything different at all. If you could somehow find a way to build a table out of antimatter, it would just be a table. That's weird, right? What if in those few hot moments after the Big Bang, the universe was completely made of antimatter? Would it feel exactly the same to us? I mean, think about it. If antimatter and matter are exactly the same, then what's the difference? If the whole universe was made of antimatter, we would just call it matter. And what we think of as matter would actually be antimatter. All the things we call positive, they're just relative to our experience. All the charges are relative, with our universe arbitrarily being made of matter. Physics gets really weird when you get right down to it. In the end, an antimatter universe based on everything we know would look and feel exactly the same as our own. But more research is needed. Scientists trapped antimatter for the first time in 2010. Now, just a few short years later, they've learned to trap more than a dozen antiatoms at a time over and over and over again. Woo woo! Antimatter has been held by experiments here for many, many months. And uh, indeed, one of the experiments has a collection of antiprotons that uh, they grabbed onto sometime early last year, and they've actually still have the same antiprotons that they've had the whole time. But even still, after a bit, they have to let the antimatter go. Then it annihilates and disappears. But even though annihilation does sound like a big, violent, terrible thing, it's actually kind of like a b The scientists do see some gamma radiation, and then that's all she wrote. Practically speaking, CERN has only made 10 nanograms of antimatter ever. Ever. All the energy from annihilating that could only power one light bulb for, say, four hours. And to make that antimatter takes a billion times more energy than we get back from annihilating it. There's not a lot of practical applications for this antimatter research yet, but... Uh, antimatter is actually commonly used in uh, a lot of medical techniques, such as uh, positron emission tomography. It's also called a PET scan, and it's used for cancer diagnoses. Look, Star Trek famously traveled the universe using engines that ran on matter-antimatter reactions. There's a lot of potential here, but based on what we know of anti-hydrogen, whether we could do that in the future is a big old shrug. At the moment, almost a century after it was first theorized, antimatter research is still in its infancy. But thanks to Dr. Birch and dozens of grad students and scientists around the world, maybe someday we'll know more. The antimatter factory make their antiprotons using the Large Hadron Collider. But do you even know what the Large Hadron Collider is? We went there, check it out here. It's gonna blow your mind. How do you guys feel about physics with no practical application? Boring or incredible? Tell us in the comments. Please subscribe for more Seeker. And don't thank even you so do much anything. for watching. Don't subscribe, don't subscribe, don't comment. The whole. I mean, you can comment if you have questions. Not preventing you from doing that. So let's move on. All right. So, antimatter, antimatter, antimatter. So every every kind of matter has an antimatter. So protons, there are antiprotons, right? They're the antimatter version of protons. Anti electrons, we call them positrons. So the the antimatter of electrons. And so all that happens is that they have the opposite charge. That's the only thing that happens. If an electron has a charge of plus one. Well, then a positron would have a charge of, oh, wait, I mean, electron, if an electron has a charge of negative one, a positron would have a charge of plus one. If a proton had a charge of plus one, then an antiproton would have a charge of negative one. And they would all behave in the same way, though. It doesn't matter. This really depends on perspective. Again, like what was said in the video. 
if we were in another universe made up of antimatter where all the protons had a charge of negative one and all the electrons had a charge of plus one, we would, they would all behave the same way. And nothing would be different. It would just be normal matter to us. So, in the end, it's just flipped. But they do exist. And so, it, well, if proton, if there are anti-protons, there, then there must mean that there are anti-quarks too. right? Because an anti-proton cannot be made up of quarks. It must be made up of anti-quarks. And anti-quarks, likewise, has an opposite charge. Right, antiquarks have an opposite charge, and we depict uh, antimatter, antimatter symbols, with a uh, what's this? A bar on top of it. So if a proton was represented by the symbol P, then an antiproton would be represented by the symbol P bar, P bar. And so that's really the only thing. You just put a bar on top of it if it's antimatter. So again, they would be the same thing: hydrogen, anti-hydrogen, proton, anti-proton, electron, positron. Right? They would have the same. They would opposite charges, but they would probably still behave the same way. So again, in an antiproton, there are anti-quarks. Right, so it's still made up of two up quarks and one down quark, but instead of quarks, they're anti quarks. The two anti quarks, one anti down quark. I'm not sure if you call that. Let's call it up anti quark or anti up quark. It doesn't matter. It's the anti quarks, right? It's just the opposite, and you, we denote it by the symbol with the bar on top of it. So again, as mentioned in the video, PET scans work uh, by this method, right? You create positrons by decay, by decay of neutrons, right? Radioactive decay of neutrons, you create positrons. And then when you shine positrons uh, through the body, the positrons collide with electrons. They produce gamma rays. And then your PET scans, uh, they detect the gamma rays. And so that's how that's a very simple explanation of how PET scans work. And again, when you have these, when you have matter and antimatter collisions, when you have up quark and anti quark, up anti quark collisions, what's going to happen when these two collide? Well, you're going to create a bunch of other uh, leptons or bunch of other leptons or uh, or baryons right so a ton of other particles get created and likewise these particles decay or disappear or collide within the next nanosecond after creation so they go into existence and out of existence uh, on a extremely fast scale so now we can learn about mesons and mesons, according to your reference table, it's made up of a quark and anti-quark. And mesons are very short-lived particles that exist, right? Because if matter and antimatter collide, well, what's going to happen? They're going to collide and uh, destroy each other and, and form energy. And energy is going to be the resultant result. So now we can learn about mesons. And mesons, according to your reference table, it's made up of a quark and anti-quark. And mesons are very short-lived particles that exist, right? Because if matter and antimatter collide, well, what's going to happen? They're going to collide and uh, destroy each other and, and form energy. And energy is going to be the resultant result. And so a common question you could be asked is, well, what is the composition of a meson? What could be the, co the composition of a meson with a charge of plus one elementary charges could be what? Right, so you want a charge of plus one. So let's go back to here. 
well, we want one plus one elementary charge, right? And so we know that we need one quark and one antiquark because that's the composition of a meson, right? This is a composition of a meson. Well, let's just go simple. Well, it could be an up quark, right? Let's let's take an up quark, which is has a charge of plus two thirds. So that's an up quark. Up quark. Well, to get plus one, we need plus one third, right? How are we going to get plus one third? Well, that's where the anti quark comes in. And so we can say down anti quark. Well, if a down quark, according to your reference table, has a charge of negative one third, well, an anti quark, right, the opposite of down quark, would have a charge of plus one third, right? It's the opposite. Anti quarks are opposite. So an up quark and a down anti quark would give you a charge of plus one elementary charges. And that would be your meson. That would be. Your meson. Uh, yeah, so I explained up one quark, so now you need to have opposite charges a bit. Sure, sure, sure. And then, oh yeah, something I forgot to write down is that we would label this. And so this composition right here, up quark and down anti quark, the symbol for it would be U and a D bar. So this would be the symbol for it. And the bar symbolizes antiquarks. So this would be this would have a total charge of plus one elementary charges. Alright, cool. Anything else? Anything else? Uh I already did this. I mean Sure. You don't really need to learn how weak force works. Yeah, the weak force is not necessary to learn about. Uh, let's, let's, let's actually do that. So so this is how the weak force works. A neutrino, there's something called a boson particle, or rather a boson force carrier. Boson force carrier goes through the... Here. So you have a neutrino and a neutron, right? So this is a neutrino and neutron. The boson uh, force carrier goes from the neutrino to the neutron. What happens? The boson combines with the down. Well, it doesn't combine it, it annihilates. So then the neutrino, the neutrino now that has given off a boson part, a force carrier, becomes an electron. What happens to the neutron? The neutron becomes an up a uh, proton. Right, the neutron turns into a proton. So that's a really a very simplistic explanation of the weak force. The weak force has something to do with uh, decay of particles. All right, that's it.